Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is November 3, 1982, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 80. Beginning with this AUDIO LETTER, I am making a small shift in my recording schedule from the end of each month to early in the month. This change will help reduce conflicts with holidays and other problems during the course of the year. For years now a familiar slogan has been used in the advertisements for a popular pain reliever. The slogan was so effective that it helped build annual sales of nearly half a billion dollars. The pain reliever became number one in America with 37 percent of the market, and yet for weeks now this famous slogan has been heard no more. The slogan was, Trust Tylenol. Hospitals do. Literally overnight just a month ago, Americans by the millions stopped trusting Tylenol. A number of people in Chicago had suddenly died after taking extra strength Tylenol capsules. By October 1, six were dead and a number of others gravely ill. A few days later the death toll rose to seven. The Tylenol capsules which they had taken had been contaminated with one of the deadliest of all poisons cyanide. Instantly headlines about the Tylenol Massacre pushed all other news stories into the background here in the United States. A nationwide alert went out for people to stop taking Tylenol capsules until further notice. Everyone was told to look for two suspect batches of Tylenol, identifiable by their serial numbers. The booming Tylenol capsule production line was shut down. The manufacturer launched a Tylenol capsule recall program. Many Tylenol products were withdrawn from drugstore shelves, and those that remained were shunned by frightened customers. Thus began a news story which has remained on everyone's tongue for a solid month. In most cases, even the most dramatic news stories begin to lose their impact after a week or so, but not the Tylenol scare. It has been nursed along week after week piece by agonizing piece, like a real-life soap opera. First there were worries that the poisoning might have been due to some horrible production line accident. Then it was found that the deadly capsules had been poisoned deliberately. After a week or so, new Tylenol poisoning cases came to light in Oroville, California, and in Philadelphia. Those stories revived fears of a nationwide poisoning threat all over again. By mid-month, the search for the Tylenol Killer was closing in on the Chicago area itself. For another week or so there were sensational stories day after day about alleged hot leads in the case. Gradually they all fizzled out, but only after keeping the story alive a while longer. By late in October the Tylenol scare was at last beginning to die down in its impact. But the Tylenol Massacre was made to order to spawn copycat crimes by a few unstable individuals here and there. Those copycat crimes were slow in coming, so the major media were enlisted to help set them off. Time after time television news reports about the Tylenol tragedy digressed into discussions in the What If category. What if the poison had been put not in Tylenol but perhaps food or Halloween candy, said the television voices. Time after time they pointed out how easy it would be to do that and get away with it. And sure enough, suddenly it started happening. Here and there people received eye burns from adulterated eye drops. A man ended up in hospital after poisoning by way of a carton of chocolate milk, and Halloween candy began showing up with poison, needles, and razor blades. What had started as a Tylenol scare a month ago has become an ever-widening fear of adulteration of everything we buy for food or health. My friends, the Tylenol Massacre and all the other fears it has spawned will fade from our minds eventually, but for now it has done its job to perfection. That job was to take our attention away from certain events on the international scene for now and to turn our attention inward instead. This change was desired by the American Bolsheviks because of their failure in September to set off Nuclear War I on schedule. For the moment the Bolsheviks here are responding by turning their energies inward to the domestic scene more intensely than before. As it stands right now, the Bolshevik-dominated Reagan Administration expects to emphasize domestic matters for roughly the coming year. 
They want to press forward with the quiet new Bolshevik Revolution here in America to tighten their control over you and me. At the same time, they also want to try to finish off their deadly rivals for power, the Rockefeller Cartel. If the Bolsheviks here can succeed in doing these things, they will be in far better position to try again at nuclear war. At present, my friends, the tentative plans of the Bolsheviks here call for a new crisis sequence toward nuclear war to begin late in 1983 and culminate in war itself in early 1984. It would take that long for the military preparations for nuclear war to be recycled up to peak readiness. Between now and then you can expect major crises to erupt overseas which may look like they hold a threat of nuclear war in themselves, but these interim crises over the next year or so will actually have a different purpose. They will not be intended to lead in themselves to nuclear war, but to improve America's geostrategic position. If successful, this process will improve the Pentagon's chances when it is time for nuclear war itself. The process of turning inward by the Bolsheviks here is a temporary one, but very important. It must be understood if you are to understand many coming events in our economy and in politics. At the same time, we must also keep our eye on the ball and look beyond the temporary inward emphasis of the next year or so. And it is time for an important update about what the Kremlin is doing in response to all these things. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1, America's economic decline into a new dark ages. Topic No. 2, war countdown toward the Israeli year of doom. And Topic No. 3, changing of the guard in the new Kremlin. Topic No. 1, in recent weeks there has been one seemingly bright spot in the increasingly grim United States economy. With unemployment climbing, bankruptcy spreading, and factories idle, the stock market alone has acted cheerful. In August the prospect of dropping interest rates became the excuse for a dramatic upturn in stock prices. Over the past two and a half months we've seen a series of wild swings on Wall Street that seem to defy all logic. Records have been set in trading volume on one day only to be shattered by an even larger record on another day. Several times recently the one-day jump in the Dow Jones average has reached record levels. One of those days was October 8, the same day that it was announced that the official unemployment rate has reached double digits. With unemployment at levels not seen since the Great Depression, the stock market has continued to soar. Three days after the announcement of double-digit unemployment, the stock market passed the 1,000 mark on the Dow Jones Industrial Averages. The situation we are seeing now is described well by an article released by the Associated Press in August. The article begins in the words, and I quote, Wall Street, which waited for years for the recession to begin, is starting to act like the economic downturn is just about over. Even as companies report that their profits in the second quarter were lower than last year, the stock market has continued a rally that has pushed up the Dow Jones Industrial Average to its highest levels in three years." Unquote. My friends, the article from which I just quoted was published in August, as I said, but not August of this year. It is dated August 3, 1980, over two years ago. At that time the stock market appeared to be saying the same thing it appears to be saying now that better times are just ahead. But of course better times were not ahead. The stock market bubble of two years ago burst after a while while the economy kept heading downward. What is going on in the stock market right now is just another stunt known in some circles as a bear trap. A bear trap is an episode of gross manipulation of the stock market by certain large institutional investors to unload unwanted stocks. I first described how a bear trap works in AUDIO LETTER No. 33 when a bear trap took place in the spring of 1978. Another took place around the late summer of 1980, producing the article from which I quoted earlier, and now in the autumn of 1982 we're watching as another stock market bear trap snares its victims. 
During September and especially October, large amounts of unwanted stocks were successfully dumped onto small investors. Instead of setting another new record for a one-day rise in stock prices, the Dow Jones set a more disturbing record a few days ago. On Monday, October 25, the Dow dropped more than 36 points, the largest one-day drop since the crash of 1929. The excuse given was that suddenly there are signs that those dropping interest rates just might head up again. My friends, the fact is that even a thousand on a Dow is worth only about as much as 400 a decade ago due to inflation, and the wildness of the ups and downs lately are a very ominous sign. They are a symptom of instability in the market, meaning a small stimulus produces big effects. That is what happened to the stock market in 1929 too, just before the big crash. The United States economy is fundamentally sick, and now it is having chills and fever as reflected by the stock market up and down jumps. The two engines of our economy, automobiles and construction, are still running at about half speed. In the past I've explained why a sustained depression in these two areas would inevitably spread to engulf our whole economy, and now it is happening. Unemployment, as measured by the government's grossly understated statistics, reached 10.1% in September, the highest since the Great Depression. Bankruptcies, too, have now reached a pace unequaled since the Great Depression. Farmers are in a tailspin, with projected farm incomes for 1982 down 24% from 1981. And then there are the banks. The Great Depression of the 1930s really began not with the 1929 stock market crash, but with the collapse of our banking system afterward. Likewise today, it is not the chills and fever of the stock market that are the greatest economic danger. It is the dangerous condition of our banks. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 44 in March 1979, I reported that the Bolsheviks here in America were going after the banks. The Bolshevik coup d'etat against their former Rockefeller allies had begun two months earlier with the murder of Nelson Rockefeller, and by that March Bolshevik moles were going to work throughout the Rockefeller banking empire. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 44, they were starting at the top with the giant Chase Manhattan Bank. If the American Bolsheviks can shatter Rockefeller banking power, the Rockefeller cartel may well be doomed. My friends, the process which I first made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 44 is now far advanced. During the first eight months of this year, 27 banks failed here in the United States. Many others are teetering on the edge, and on August 23 it was announced that five of America's largest banks are in deep trouble. They are deep in the red due to the inability to collect on huge bad loans. The five banks which were in the news that day are all members of the Rockefeller Group, and one of them is none other than Chase Manhattan itself. The problem of bad loans now plaguing the Rockefeller banks is destined to just keep getting worse, not better. The final crushing blow that could bring the Rockefeller banks crashing down is the mountain of bad loans to foreign countries. Years ago, when the Rockefeller cartel had no rival in governmental power here, those loans were made without concern. Whenever loans went bad, they always made sure the American taxpayer bailed them out through various governmental devices, but now the situation has changed. The Rockefeller cartel no longer exercises sufficient power over the whole of the United States Government to bail itself out in this way. Instead, their enemies, the Bolsheviks here, are increasingly able to block the Rockefeller Group. This new situation was reflected in the World Economic Conference of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund two months ago. At the conference, which was held in Toronto, Canada, the Rockefeller and Bolshevik factions squared off against one another, and, my friends, the Bolsheviks won. Here is basically what happened. Rockefeller cartel banking operatives, both from America and from abroad, argued for increased quotas for the International Monetary Fund. That is, they argued that the United States and other developed nations should donate tens of billions of dollars 
to cover increased international loans. Rockefeller spokesmen presented their arguments in terms of the needs of the Third World nations, but what they were really worried about was the possible consequences to their own banks of bad loans to the Third World. Increased IMF quotas from participating nations could have helped bail them out of trouble. That is what the Rockefeller Group tried to do by enlisting the support of the Third World nations themselves, but the American Bolsheviks squashed it. Speaking in Toronto on September 6, the entity Reagan declared, the United States cannot afford to bail out the world. What he really meant was that America's Bolshevik Government was not about to bail out the Rockefeller cartel, and with that increased IMF quotas were refused. So now, my friends, the Rockefeller cartel banking interests face an untenable situation. They hold vast amounts of loans to Third World countries, and a lot of it is bunching up and coming due. During 1983 more than half a trillion dollars in these loans will be coming due. About 80 percent of that could end up going unpaid to the banks by financially troubled nations. That would add up to a combined default of more than $400 billion. If the big banks should lose even a fraction of that unthinkable amount, it will spell disaster for America's entire banking system. Very quickly the collapse will engulf the entire international banking system as well. As major American banks collapse, credit lines to industry will be cut off. Unable to finance continued operations, more and more businesses will close their doors. Unemployment will mushroom, and the depression which we already experience will grow far worse. The public will clamor for the government to do something, and do something it will. There will be reflation of our currency, that is, more inflation in the depths of depression. And sooner or later the entity President Reagan or his successor will declare a national economic emergency, shades of FDR in 1933. There is an ironic parallel between all of this and what happened half a century ago to trigger the Great Depression. In the early 1930s a major New York bank called the United States Bank of New York, a private bank, teetered on the edge of failure. The bank appealed for help to the Federal Reserve System, which by its charter is supposed to be the lender of last resort, but the Federal Reserve refused to come to its aid. The result, which was predictable, was the failure of the United States Bank. That started a chain reaction due to shared loan arrangements and other factors which linked that bank to many others. When the United States Bank failed, it dragged down others, which dragged down still others. The progressive collapse of much of America's banking system dragged America's whole economy downward into the Great Depression, and all because of the deliberate inaction of the privately owned Federal Reserve System. Today the parallel to all this is taking place at the international level. This time it is not just one bank, but the whole Rockefeller banking network that is teetering due to bad international loans. So the bankers have appealed for help through the international analog of the Federal Reserve System, that is, the IMF. But at the Toronto Economic Conference the so-called Reagan Administration prevented that aid from being given. As a result, the whole Rockefeller banking network is heading toward almost certain disaster, and because the linkages among banks that existed in the 1930s exist again today, the whole banking system of America and the world is threatened. The irony, my friends, is just this. In the 1930s it was the Rockefeller interests who helped to bring about the banking system collapse through their effective control of the Federal Reserve System. That was how they acquired effective control of American banking after it was rebuilt. But this time the shoe is on the other foot. This time it is the Rockefeller bankers themselves who want help and who face disaster because it has been denied them. The United States is leading the world into a new depression even worse than that of the 1930s, but there is a fundamental difference between what happened 50 years ago and what is happening now. That difference has to do with our currency itself. 
In the thirties times were hard, but at least our money was still stable and valuable. It was tough to earn a dollar, but if you did, you could buy a lot with it. Today in the eighties it's different. The dollar is no longer stable. Its value is shrinking before our very eyes. While jobs are vanishing and wages are being restrained, even the dollars we do earn are losing their buying power. The fact is that the United States dollar is being destroyed deliberately. It is this process of ruining our money itself that is leading to all the other chain reactions that are plunging us into depression. This is what I was talking about in my 1973 book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, and the destructive tampering with America's currency is continuing and even speeding up now. A year and a half ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 63 I revealed a scheme was being cooked up to do away with our present $100 bill. At that time the plan was still in its infancy. Since then it has continued to evolve even though the original target date in late 1981 was not met. On the first day of last month, October 1982, the stage began to be set for action in Congress. A Pennsylvania Congressman, Richard Schultz, introduced a bill which is tailor-made to Treasury Department specifications. The bill is designated H.R. 7283 and has the following long-winded title, To provide for the retirement of all United States notes of the denomination of $100 and their replacement with new notes of such denomination. As the title implies, the present version of the scheme embodies one noticeable difference from that which I reported a year and a half ago. Originally the plan was to suddenly repudiate the $100 bill altogether. Now the plan is instead to take away the present hundreds but replace them with new issue hundreds that look radically different. This refinement in tactics makes the plan look a little different, but it will still accomplish all of the original objectives. To see how little the plan has really changed in the past year and a half, one need only look at the bill now before Congress, H.R. 7283. The original secret plan required that the present $100 bill be declared illegal tender. Likewise, subsection C of the bill in Congress says, quote, Such notes shall cease to be legal tender on a date to be determined by the Secretary." Unquote. The original secret plan called for holders of $100 bills to be given a brief turn-in period before they became worthless, and now H.R. 7283 says in subsection C, quote, The Secretary shall provide for a 10-day period during which holders of circulating United States notes of $100 to be retired may exchange such notes for new issue notes." Unquote. A key aspect of the original secret plan was that anyone turning in more than a modest amount of hundreds will become automatic targets of suspicion. Your name, address, and Social Security number were to be taken for investigation. And sure enough, here is what H.R. 7283 now says in subsection C, quote, In any case in which any one holder exchanges $100 notes in the value of $5,000 or more, a record of the name, address, and Social Security or Federal Employer Identification Number shall be recorded and forwarded to the Department of the Treasury." Unquote. Subsection D then says that this information will be provided, quote, to Federal, State, and local law enforcement agencies for use in criminal investigation or prosecution." Unquote. The excuses being given for all this are still following the secret plan I made public a year and a half ago. In AUDIO LETTER No. 63 I reported that the $100 bill ploy would be justified as an attack on crime and inflation. When Congressman Schultz introduced the bill on October 1, he followed the Treasury script to the letter. In his remarks printed that day in the Congressional Record, Schultz said, quote, The purpose of this bill is to aid law enforcement officials in the fight against drug trafficking and other crime. A side benefit would be the reduction in volume of dollars in the underground economy." Unquote. But my friends, the true purposes of the Treasury-inspired $100 bill stratagem are far different from those claimed. It is actually a power play aimed partly at you and me and partly at the enemy of the Bolsheviks 
the Rockefeller Cartel. The excuses of attacking crime and inflation are only a means to an end to close down America. To help protect yourself and your family in these very difficult times, I have outlined what you can do in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar. It is still good advice today. The main point is that you have most of your assets abroad in hard currencies, not dollars, and also you should consider the currency hedge funds in the common market, which help you to beat inflation. My friends, our money system is being corrupted and destroyed. The result is a progressive, irreversible disintegration of our economy of a kind that did not happen in the 30s. We are slipping backward in the direction of the Dark Ages. Honest, stable money is essential to civilization itself. In primitive cultures there is no money. Everything is done by barter. That works only for very simple societies. The standardized medium of exchange known as money is essential in order to make transactions more flexible and easy. It opens a way for individuals to specialize more according to their skills. With specialization comes diversity, breakthroughs, and advancement of civilization itself. All of that starts coming apart when money becomes a manipulated, unstable, dishonest commodity. The most dramatic and most ominous sign that a society's money is becoming useless is the reappearance of barter. It means that the society's normal medium of exchange, money, is not working. Today barter systems are spreading like wildfire across America, and as it does, our civilization itself is disintegrating. Our ruler's greed for power is now leading us all toward a new Dark Ages. Topic No. 2 For several years now the nuclear strategy of the United States has been a first-strike strategy. Top Pentagon military strategists are preparing actively for nuclear war with Russia, and they intend for America to strike first. It was not always this way. In fact, America's shift onto a first-strike posture is a new development in American history. This is true even though America's leaders have repeatedly gotten America into war deliberately. The difference is that in the past America was always dragged into war by at least appearing to be attacked first. That enabled American public opinion to be rallied behind the desired war against the chosen enemy. This approach has always been necessary because most Americans would never support a war that they knew to be America's fault. America's deliberate involvement in falsely defensive wars began as long ago as 1898. On February 15 of that year the American battleship Maine was resting peacefully at anchor in the harbor at Havana, Cuba. Suddenly a giant explosion rocked the ship and it blew apart. Some 260 American fighting men aboard the ship lost their lives. To the cry of, Remember the Maine, America went off to war. Afterward, overwhelming evidence was found that the Spaniards had not been responsible for the Maine disaster. Instead, American saboteurs had done the deed in order to bring on the desired war, but by the time those facts began to surface quietly, most Americans were not paying attention. We were just too pleased with ourselves for having crushed Spain and become suddenly a global power. In 1941 America's leaders were spoiling for an even bigger war than America had ever fought before. The reasons had to do with Saudi Arabian oil first and foremost, as I have detailed in the past. The Rockefeller Standard oil interests had been locked out of the Persian Gulf by British boycott tactics. To cure that problem, the Rockefeller Cartel had helped create a threat to Britain in the form of Adolf Hitler. By 1940 the threat was doing its job. The Battle of Britain was underway, and Churchill was finally willing to come to terms. If the United States would intervene and stop Hitler, then after the war America could have the Saudi oil. To carry out the bargain, FDR and his Rockefeller sponsors had to get America into war somehow. 
but most Americans did not want war. The only way to change our minds about that was to arrange for America to be attacked. The Germans were in no position to do that, but Japan was, and Japan, Germany, and Italy were inseparably linked through the Tripartite Treaty. So if Japan could be lured into attacking the United States, we would also be at war with Germany automatically. As a bonus, this strategy also promised great new gains for the United States in the Pacific itself. The solution, of course, was Pearl Harbor. When FDR called it a day of infamy, he was right. Roosevelt himself and other top American leaders were guilty of high treason for their role in setting up the Pearl Harbor disaster. I have given many details about this in past AUDIO letters, including Numbers 1, 14, 22, and 34. Just in recent months, four decades after the fact, pieces of the story have started to leak out and become more widely known. For example, a book was published recently by the Pulitzer Prize winning historian John Toland entitled Infamy, Pearl Harbor and Its Aftermath. In the book he documents the fact that FDR and his top military leaders had plenty of advance warning of the attack, and yet no warning was given to the forces at Pearl Harbor. Why? Because FDR wanted the Japanese attack to succeed. The deliberate sacrifice of more than 2,000 American servicemen's lives was just the right medicine to cure America's anti-war attitude. To the cries of, Remember Pearl Harbor, we Americans went off to war to win Saudi oil for the Rockefeller Oil Cartel. Once again, today's rulers of the United States are trying to get America into another big war, but this time they dare not allow the enemy, Russia, to strike first as was done at Pearl Harbor by Japan. America's rulers in 1941 could afford the luxury of throwing away a big chunk of naval power in the Pearl Harbor attack. There was no chance that Japan could go on to actually defeat the United States with its enormous industrial might, but today it's different. Today the luxury of time is gone. If the weapons are not ready when war begins, they cannot be built in time to help, and even more importantly, the intended enemy today is far more powerful militarily than the United States. And so today's top Pentagon strategists are first strike-oriented. In any military campaign, he who strikes the first blow always has the advantage. If the first blow is also a surprise, the advantage is tremendous because of all factors of military strategy, surprise is the most important. Just six weeks ago on September 17, the United States came within hours of actually launching a surprise nuclear first strike against Russia. It was the culmination of our hurry-up war plan about which I first began reporting last February in AUDIO LETTER No. 72. The struggle over this war plan spawned major headlines this year. These included the Falklands War last spring and the sudden forced resignation of Secretary of State Alexander Haig last June. The plan suffered repeated setbacks, and yet it stayed on schedule. It was only during the final two weeks or so that the so-called Project Z war plan finally fell apart too far to proceed. The critical events which brought this about were a policy change in Red China, Russian military action in space, and limited public exposure at the last minute. I detailed all this a month ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 79. The war planners here were frustrated this time, my friends, but they came very close to succeeding. Having come that close, they are convinced they will succeed on the next attempt, and so they already have a new war plan underway. Under this new plan, preliminary preparations and crises are scheduled for about the coming year. Then in late 1983 they presently expect to begin a new final crisis sequence to lead into a nuclear war itself in early 1984. The new war plan was set in motion on September 14, three days before the abortive end of Project Z. The Israeli plan to murder Lebanese President-elect Bashir Jamal 
which I had made public the previous month, was carried out. That provided the excuse for the Israelis to invade Beirut and quickly arrange for a mass murder of Palestinian civilian refugees. The real payoff of all this was the return of American Marines to Beirut in the beginning of a new and open-ended deployment in Lebanon. In AUDIO LETTERS 78 and 79 I reported that the Marines have been sent there to become the focus of a major incident. This will come about under the joint plan of the Bolshevik-controlled United States Pentagon and the Israeli Mossad. The Mossad is to arrange for a number of our Marines to be killed in an incident that will be blamed on the Arabs. This will be used to inflame American public opinion to help lead us into war, including ultimately nuclear war. It is to be a replay of the strategy used in 1898 with the battleship Maine. Already our psychological conditioning for this planned incident to come is underway. Just two days ago a car bomb exploded close to a Marine position in the south of Beirut. There were no serious injuries this time because they were not meant to be any, but the atmosphere of danger to our Leathernecks is being dramatized. At the same time, the Government is starting to talk about sending in more Marines, many more, perhaps up to 5,000, and those who are already in Lebanon are gradually fanning out into more and more dangerous duty areas. All of this was set in motion in spite of blunt Russian warnings. This was accomplished by carrying out the Beirut Massacre, but the Massacre also had a dangerous side effect in the form of worldwide condemnation of Israel. Throughout the latter half of September the reaction to the Beirut Massacre was building fast, especially among the public of Israel and America. Within Israel itself ways were available to maneuver the protests and keep them from getting out of control, but here in the United States it was essential to snuff out the reaction to the Massacre very quickly. Otherwise it could have done real damage to the Bolshevik Zionist junta that runs the American and Israeli military machine. People were beginning to question America's blind support for Israel's military power. In order to blot out the Beirut Massacre from American mines, a second massacre was perpetrated barely two weeks later. It was a Tyanol Massacre. The specter of over a thousand rotting bodies in far-off Beirut were quickly forgotten in the scare over those seven deaths in Chicago. For most Americans the Tylenol scare just blanked out everything else. It was an evil masterpiece of psychological trickery. Most of us find it hard to identify with what happened in Beirut, but we can certainly identify with a person taking a headache pill. One story had to do with a lot of foreign people in far-off land. The other had to do with what was portrayed as a threat to each of us personally. As I discussed in my introduction, the Tylenol story stayed on the front page for a solid month all through October. Now finally there is starting to be some renewed emphasis of the Beirut tragedy in the news. We are hearing about eyewitnesses to the slaughter who have contradicted Defense Minister Sharon's claim that the Israelis could not see the killing. But now the psychological danger point is past for the Israelis. It's now old news to most people. No matter what comes out now, it will have almost no chance of interfering with the ongoing war plans. The Reagan Bolsheviks and the Begin Zionists are looking ahead to next year, but in doing so the Israeli Cabinet has suddenly noticed something that makes their blood run cold. It is right there on the Hebrew lunar calendar, which uses Hebrew letters instead of numbers to designate the year. For the next Jewish New Year, my friends, those letters spell the word DOOM. The Begin Cabinet is reacting to this discovery as if the finger of God had appeared and written that word DOOM on the wall of the Knesset, and no wonder, because they have blood on their hands. The present Jewish New Year began with the Beirut Massacre carried out under the authority of the Begin Cabinet, but the militant Zionists in Israel are reacting as they always react when confronted with unwelcome facts. They never consider changing their own ways. 
Instead, their solution is, in their own words, to create new facts, and that is how they are trying to erase that word doom from their calendar. On October 22, a resolution was passed before the Begin Cabinet to change the designation of the next new year by rearranging the letters. The American Bolsheviks and their Israeli Zionist allies are starting a lengthy process of recycling their war plans for another try. One factor in this new process is Bolshevik intrigue to try to set off war between India and Pakistan. In AUDIO LETTER No. 78 I reported that this war was targeted for this month, November 1982, if Project Z did not succeed first. The key to war between India and Pakistan is the disputed territory between them of Kashmir. Kashmir has been held together in relative stability since 1975 by Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah, known as the Line of Kashmir. But about five months ago Abdullah started having a series of heart attacks. The heart attacks, my friends, were not natural. Finally, two months ago on September 8, he succumbed to one of these attacks. Abdullah's removal from the scene has helped start setting the stage for the Indo-Pakistani War I warned about in August. But the Russians know what is afoot, and they are advising India's leader Indira Gandhi to defuse the situation. As a result, she invited Pakistan's General Zia to New Delhi for talks on improving relations. Zia arrived there two days ago, met with Mrs. Gandhi, and left a group of diplomats to talk further. Whether all this will prevent the war is an open question, but at least it should help slow down the Bolshevik intrigues. The process of recycling for another war try involves many aspects of the total military picture. For one thing, the Bolshevik Pentagon war planners hope to rebuild some semblance of their secret weapons reserves. I have first reported on their existence and role in the intended nuclear war in AUDIO LETTER No. 73. These were the real reason for the Southern Hemisphere War last spring, of which the Falklands War was only the visible part. I can now report that the Bolshevik-controlled secret naval facilities were not destroyed even though they were put out of action. A crash program is now underway to repair the damage, both at South Georgia Island and at the two southern New Zealand sites. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 74, a portion of the Bolshevik Stealth Navy escaped altogether from the hostilities. Another aspect of the Pentagon's recycling process has to do with America's newly deployed secret stealth planes called Phantom War Planes. These have yet to be tested in combat, but they are believed to be capable of successfully attacking Russia. But due to the sudden change in China's policies in early September, the crucial Sinkiang Province launch area is presently unavailable. Should it still be unavailable a year from now, the Pentagon is determined to have the next best backup site ready to go. That backup site, my friends, is none other than Kashmir the disputed area between India and Pakistan. It is far inferior to Sinkan Province, China, being nearly twice as far away from Russia's Cosmosphere bases, but it is still better than anything else. So don't be surprised if Pakistan goes ahead and attacks India to seize Kashmir within the next year. Talks or no talks. And then there is the Space Shuttle. As I've detailed in past tapes, the Space Shuttle is the indispensable key to the Pentagon's plans to use space for the coming nuclear war. All four Space Shuttle missions up to now have been military missions described to the public as test flights. Now Space Shuttle Launch No. 5 is about to take place, scheduled for November 11, just a few days from now. Now the alleged test schedule has been used up. In order to preserve appearances, there is no choice but to start following through now with some launches of civilian payloads. That is what Space Shuttle 5, now on the pad at Cape Canaveral, will be doing. For the first time there will be no military payload on this shuttle. For that reason, on this flight we will probably get to see what is actually happening during the mission. Space Shuttle 5 will be a first in other ways too. 
The first four flights used a skeleton crew of only two astronauts. This time there are four, Allen, Brand, Overmeyer, and Lenore, three of whom are civilians. But the most important first for Space Shuttle 5 will be one that is totally unsuspected by the public. My friends, this will be the first mission to use just one shuttle from start to finish. The first four missions used the two-shuttle stratagem, which I first made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 62. Each time we watched a shuttle with the name Columbia on the side takeoff from Florida. Once in orbit, the plan called for the astronauts to carry out their military mission while the public was shown falsified space movies about the flight. Then the two-man crew was to return to Earth, not aboard the shuttle itself, but aboard a two-man re-entry capsule. The shuttle itself, if possible, was to return to Earth unmanned, landing by computer control in Western Australia. Finally, back on Earth, the two astronauts boarded a different shuttle with the name Columbia on the side. It was boosted to high speed and then glided to Earth for the public to watch, but this time it will be different. This time it is a non-military mission, and there are four astronauts, too many to fit into a re-entry capsule. The shuttle which takes off from Florida will have to land in California five days later. The NASA military shuttle managers believe there will be no trouble from Russia on this flight. It is purely non-military, and this shuttle is unarmed. But there is still one major worry. That worry, my friends, is just this. Will the thermal tiles really work? No one knows because no Space Shuttle has ever re-entered from orbital velocity before. All four of the shuttles we have watched blast off from Florida have been destroyed in space by Russian space weapons before they could return to Earth. So Space Shuttle 5 will actually make the first test of the tiles. NASA believes that the tiles will hold. If they do, the landing at Edwards Air Force Base on November 16 will look just like the four fake landings we have seen up to now. If the tiles do not work, four astronauts may pay with their lives for the NASA deception up to now. Even so, having falsified four allegedly successful landings, NASA will find a way to explain it away if Space Shuttle 5 should end in disaster, because a year from now the Space Shuttle will be needed to start preparing for war once again. Topic No. 3 On Wednesday, October 27, the man known as President Leonid Brezhnev delivered a speech of major importance in Moscow. The speech came on the heels of a surprise conference of all Warsaw Pact foreign ministers convened in Moscow just five days earlier. The importance of the Brezhnev speech was emphasized in every way possible. Brezhnev was flanked on the podium by his five senior colleagues in the Politburo, and his audience of more than 500 consisted of the entire upper crust of the giant Soviet military establishment. Present were all top Defense Ministry officials all Soviet Marshals, the commanders of all the Russian military services, all regional Soviet commanders, the commanders of Soviet forces abroad, and the top echelon of the Policy Directorate of the Armed Forces. The Brezhnev speech was directed first and foremost to the military and to the Russian technological establishment which backs them up, but it was also directed to the entire Soviet public and was broadcast in its entirety over nationwide television. In his speech, Brezhnev accused the United States of trying to bring about nuclear war. He said that America's leaders have, quote, raised the intensity of their military preparations to an unprecedented level, and he accused the so-called Reagan Administration of, and I quote again, an aggressive policy which is threatening to push the world into the flames of nuclear war, unquote. My friends, government and major media spokesmen always try to lead us Americans to discount all accusations like that by Russian leaders, but those harsh words of October 27 in Moscow were not just rhetoric. Far from it. Brezhnev was referring to the Pentagon's Project Z nuclear strike plan, which came within hours of execution just six weeks ago. 
Brezhnev even alluded to the super-weapon aspect of the present war threat. America's radically new Phantom Warplanes are designed to nullify Russia's ability to stave off an attack with her beam weapons. Brezhnev assessed the situation in the words, Competition in military technology has sharply intensified, often acquiring a fundamentally new character." Unquote and he exhorted Russia's technologists to find the solutions to the threat. The Brezhnev speech was most notable for the change of policy which it revealed. For 18 years now the Brezhnev image has been associated with détente, but in this speech all that was virtually abandoned, devalued. Aside from one brief passing reference, no hope was held out for reviving détente with America's rulers. Instead, the whole thrust of the speech was that the Russian people must prepare militarily for the days ahead. It was not a saber-rattling speech directed at America. It was a call to arms directed to his own people. My friends, the significance of this major change in stated policy can hardly be overstated. It reflects two very important developments. One of the developments that led to the Brezhnev speech is the Kremlin's assessment of the inevitability of NUCLEAR WAR ONE. As I have reported on past occasions, Russia's new anti-Bolshevik rulers know their old Bolshevik enemies only too well. Having ousted the Bolsheviks from control of Russia, the new Kremlin now is confronted by a Bolshevik-controlled American military. The Russians are convinced that the Bolsheviks will just keep trying to set off NUCLEAR WAR until they finally succeed, and Project Z was such a close call in September that the Russians are not optimistic that they can stop the next attempt. The second development that led to the Brezhnev speech of October 27 is that a changing of the guard is underway in the Kremlin. It's not a power struggle in the old Bolshevik sense of intrigue and infighting. Instead, it's an orderly succession among a tightly knit group of men who are convinced that Russia must prepare for action, and they want to take advantage of the law right now while the Bolsheviks here regroup in the wake of the Project Z failure in September. The Russian people are being prepared for the end of the Brezhnev era in the very near future. For the very first time ever, preparations are underway for a Soviet leader to peacefully and voluntarily retire with honors. It will be just one more step in the new Kremlin's gradual step-by-step -step program of changing the rules of life in Russia. In one sense, the so-called Brezhnev retirement will only be a ceremonial fiction. The real Brezhnev died of complications from Russian flu on January 7, 1978. I first reported his incapacitation and replacement by a ceremonial double in AUDIO LETTER No. 30. Later in AUDIO LETTER No. 33 I was able to report the date of his death. Since that time several doubles have been employed to maintain the Brezhnev image until the time was ripe for change. That time, my friends, has now arrived. During the interim since the real Brezhnev's death, a succession of several men have held the reins of top power in Russia. First it was Defense Minister Ustinov, leader of the White Doves. Then it was the head of the Soviet Navy, Admiral Gorshkov. Next, power was shared among several men, but none of these men could truly fill the shoes of the departed Brezhnev, and the search for more effective leadership has continued. Now, my friends, that search is at an end. The new ruler of Russia has already taken the reins of power right now. It may be some time yet before his true role becomes publicly visible but his mark is already being stamped on Russian policies. It was he more than anyone else who was the architect of the startling Brezhnev speech, so-called, of October 27. Russia's new top ruler spent 15 years as head of Russia's Worldwide Intelligence Service, the KGB. When he took charge in 1967, his task was to transform the KGB by rooting out all Bolshevik power over it. His success in doing so helped set the stage for the final overthrow of the Bolsheviks from Kremlin power in 1976 and 1977. Now he has been chosen to become the top leader of the Soviet Union. 
The name of Russia's new leader is Yuri Andropov. Right now that name may be unfamiliar to you, but I urge you to start watching for it in the news. Directly or indirectly, we will be hearing more and more from Andropov from this time forward. Now it's time for my last-minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I've tried to give you some perspective on the probable direction of events over the next year or so. The Bolsheviks here failed to set off their nuclear war plan in September, so now they are recycling for another try in a year or so. Meanwhile they are turning inward to tighten their grip on America itself through economic means. At the same time, the Russians too are taking advantage of this breather for a changing of the guard in the Kremlin. They are preparing for action with a new strong leader at the helm. Here in America the destruction of our currency is continuing, with the $100 bill now targeted for special attack. By this economic route, the civilization of America itself is being undermined. Over the course of generations, we Americans have been lured to worship the so-called Almighty Dollar, so we have come under the spell of those who have made the dollar corrupt as a tool of power. In the last analysis, the most basic cause of our deepening economic crisis is something our Lord Jesus Christ tried to warn us about long ago. He said we cannot serve two masters, both God and mammon. Either we will love one or we will cling to the other. Today America as a whole is clinging to mammon and forgetting God. If that does not change, my friends, the ages ahead will be dark indeed. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.